and turn tonight to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 6. We're uh, into the second part of our study on the office of deacons. Acts chapter 6, and I will read the first seven verses, though we are uh, at the moment confining ourselves to the first three verses. It's Acts chapter 6 and verses 1 through 3. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Let's join together in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this marvelous passage of Scripture, which reminds us that you have designed the church to function decently and in order. You have ordained different men for different purposes. You have given different gifts for different accomplishments and building up of the body of Christ. You have given to us everything that is necessary, not only for the church at large, but for individual local churches, so that we might function in a way that is most pleasing to you. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings on the going forth of your word tonight, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we summarize what we looked at last week, we first gave a definition of the term deacon. It comes after a number of years of study, and uh, this is actually uh, a conclusion as we begin, so that we might understand what the office is about. 
and then we look through the different passages that help us to understand each of the different component parts to what the office of deacon is. The definition that we gave last week is that the term deacon designates spiritually mature men who have faithfully exercised the gift of ministration, and we'll be talking a little bit about that tonight and more next week, and who are appointed to distribute the material donations of believers to meet temporal needs in the assembly. Now we saw that this first appointment here in Acts chapter 6 was based on three things. Number one, church growth. And all of us would like to see church growth. They didn't have deacons uh, until we get to Acts chapter 6. The apostles were doing all of the work. They were functioning as elders. They were functioning as deacons. They were functioning as the bishops, the overseers of the church at Jerusalem. And of course, they had all the necessary spiritual gifts, for they had the gift of apostle, which included all of the other gifts, both permanent and temporary. But as the church began to grow, we find that there becomes disharmony in the church. The growth was a little bit too much for even the apostles to handle or to cover all of the bases. And so the second reason for this appointment was based on disharmony in the church. And then the third reason, which was a result uh, that also had come as a result of the church growth, was that the apostles were being forced to carry on a secondary burden and they were the ones who were supposed to be ministering the word and they did not have enough time to cover all of the necessary things that had to be done for the widows and also at the same time spend enough time in prayer and in preaching, preparing the word of God for teaching the assembly. Very important responsibilities there and we're going to see how uh, this begins to divide for us the different offices that are listed in the New Testament. When we talk about the disciples being multiplied, we see that uh, the apostles were caring for more than 8,000 people. And as we pointed out last week, it may have been as many as 16,000 because only males are listed on the day of Pentecost, special terms used there for males, not men and women. It's not anthropos, it's on air, uh, which is the technical term for males. The same thing we see as we get over to Acts chapter 4, uh, where we see, albeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. So we've got 3,000 on Pentecost. We got 5,000 more as we get over to Acts chapter 4, and it says the number of the men. And we compared that last week with uh, the passages in the Gospels, which tell us that the men were about 5,000 besides women and children. And that is in the first case of the feeding of the 5,000. And then the feeding of the 4,000, uh, a few chapters later in Matthew 15, the, they did eat were 4,000 men beside women and children. So we have a, a gigantic congregation that has gathered together here. And um, we also discover something else, that additionally, people are being added daily to the church. We see that in Acts chapter 2, following the day of Pentecost. Uh, it talks about them being in the temple and praising God. And it says, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Now, we would love to see that kind of growth here. Uh, every one of us, uh, if we were as excited, I think, and it's filled with the Spirit of God as we see the apostles uh, and the believers there in the early church. Uh, we would be witnessing to our neighbors on a daily basis. We would see the Spirit of God working in powerful ways. And we would see people being saved on a daily basis as well. We know that the initial group included women from Acts 1, 14 and 15. We see Ananias had a wife named Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. It tells us in Acts 5, 14, And believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. So we have a gigantic uh, church by the time we get to Acts chapter 6. And there's one particular group that is a very needy group in the church, and that is the widows. Uh, they're not dealing with all the rest of the women in the church. They're just dealing with widows here at this point. They have a, a tremendous need that has risen that 12 men with all the apostolic gifts could not handle. That tells you they had a very large group of widows in the church. And as we pointed out, if there were only 5% uh, of the church being widows, and we have a larger percentage than that here in our church being widows, they would have had between 700 and 800 widows if you have as many as 16,000 people in the church there at Jerusalem. So it's a rather large group that is needing to be taken care of, and the Greek-speaking widows were being neglected in the daily ministration, the daily provision of food and other necessities that they had. We pointed out ten different things last time, that internal trouble follows a victory over external trouble, that's Satan's double punch. We saw the first internal attack was an attempt to cause division. 
Unity produces power, but division produces weakness. And so when Satan couldn't get them from the outside with those outside attacks that he had brought, he now causes internal division. The third thing we noticed was the first attack was in regard to women. And we saw that Satan's first attack against man in the Garden of Eden was also against Eve. We saw the first attack was an entitlement issue. Someone who was expecting something was being neglected. And whenever we get to the issue of entitlements, once people think they deserve something, there will be disunity and there will be griping and moaning and groaning and complaining until they get what they need. We saw that the neglected people in this case were the most helpless, the ones gr drawing the greatest amount of sympathy. Uh, Satan never gets us feeling sorry for people who are uh, very unsympathetic characters. And we gave the illustration of Nazis, skinheads, and communists last week. We don't feel much sympathy for them. The need was a daily need. The need was a survival need. The need was a humble need, not a high-profile, big-shot, uh, honor-absorbing call to work. But it was a ministration. That means service. And we discovered that the term deacon also comes from the same term, diakonos, diakonia. We find these are interrelated terms that relate to humble service. Not being a big shot, but being humble in service. The first attack tried to divide the believers along national lines. Uh, all were Jews up to this point, but now we have Jews from different countries speaking at least 18 different languages, as we saw in the book of Acts. The division produced sin in the assembly. Murmuring. Murmuring, complaining, is sin. That's the reason that God killed the children of Israel in the wilderness. And we in the church have the same warning in Acts, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. If Satan can get a church into a state of complaining, Satan is able to destroy the church without lifting a finger. God himself will destroy the church. That's what happened to the children of Israel in the wilderness. God himself is the one who judged them for murmuring because the murmurings were not against his intermediaries. The murmurings were against him for not doing things the way they thought they should be done. We saw the solution of the apostles, an immediate call to action, the involvement of the entire congregation, the setting of priorities for those involved in spiritual service, that is the prayer and the preaching, setting specific goals, the work of examination and reporting back to the apostles, the congregation was to find men who were qualified according to the three qualifications that are given here in this, this passage. And so the congregation went to work looking for them, but the ones who actually appointed them were, in fact, the apostles. They retained the right to veto or appoint. You look, we appoint. Then we saw that there were seven men altogether. That in scripture, of course, is interesting because that's a complete number. And so then we find the list of their qualifications that we looked at. They were spiritual qualifications, not temporal. Although they would be dealing with temporal things, their qualifications were all spiritual qualifications. The first qualification of honest report. These were going to be men who handled money. And we looked at multiple passages dealing with honest report. The second qualification was they had to be full of the Holy Spirit. And we saw that that, as you tracked it through different portions of Scripture, was connected to wisdom, which is the next thing, of course, in that list. But being filled with the Spirit is an issue of what controls your life. When we looked at the book of Ephesians, in verses 17 and 18 says, Wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's an issue of control. Wine controls your mind, your body, and your speech. And the Holy Spirit controls your mind, your body, and your speech. And those two are set in contrast one to the other. And if you have a little bit of wine, it does a little bit of control. <laughs> if you have a lot of wine, it does a lot of control. And as you are filled with the Spirit, then he controls every aspect of your life and of your being. The issue is control. Will it be the internal control of the Holy Spirit or will it be an external control by some kind of material force? You could put drugs in, as well as alcohol in that passage and there are some very interesting words that are used later on uh, dealing with the responsibilities of elders and deacons that would include drug abuse. We'll talk about that when we get down the road a bit. Uh, we find that when you are filled with the Spirit, you will be walking in the Spirit and you will not be fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verses uh, 16 through 26 deal with the fruit of the Spirit and with walking in the Spirit. When you are filled with the Spirit of God, He flows through you and produces the fruit of the Spirit. So when the 
uh, church was given the task of finding men who are filled with the Holy Ghost, they would be men who are demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. They would be men who would be walking in the Spirit. They would be men who would not be manifesting the works of the flesh. As Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5, those are set in diametrical opposition to the fruit of the Spirit. The works of the flesh, in fact, he doesn't even give us a complete list, uh, are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is. So he sets the fruit of Spirit in contrast to the works of the flesh. A person is not filled with the Spirit when they are walking in the flesh. A, a person who is manifesting the works of the flesh is not qualified to be a deacon. Very important contrasts that are given to us. We find only a, a brief synopsis here in Acts chapter 6, but when you track these different spiritual elements, the three key elements that are given in Acts chapter 6 through the rest of the New Testament, you discover what God means by what he says through the apostles in this portion of scripture. The third qualification was that they had to be full of wisdom, and of course the primary illustration within the chapter, and as we move into chapter 7, is Stephen who knows how to preach Christ and has certain character qualities listed in the New Testament. He's not really smart. He's not just a good businessman. He's not somebody who's just financially successful. But he is one who is spiritually minded, spiritually grounded, and not merely saved. Too often we are desperate for church leadership, and we run around and try to find anybody out there who's living and breathing and can put two words together to form a sentence. Uh, that is not what the New Testament says uh, is the qualifications for any spiritual office in the church, whether elder, deacon, or bishop. So we find in Acts chapter 6, verse 10, it says, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of wisdom. And as he spoke, as he preached Christ, they could not counter him. He was a man who had divine wisdom, not merely a biblical ability to manipulate words. He was a man who was so filled with the spirit and wisdom that they could not resist the words that he spoke. So as we look at this full of wisdom and we track many passages through, I've summarized them for us quickly here. What is it to have biblical wisdom? The first thing that we see as manifested by Stephen was the man must know how to preach Christ with power. No man should be pointed to the office of deacon who does not know how to preach Christ with power. And there were about seven or eight verses that we looked at last week that related to that particular topic. The second thing, wisdom is a sign of spiritual maturity. We see that's clearly true of these men who have been chosen here in Acts chapter 4. But wisdom is a sign of spiritual maturity. There are those who are carnal. There are those who are natural. And those who are mature in Christ. And Paul exhorts the Corinthians, for example, because they are babes in Christ. They don't have wisdom. The first two or three chapters deal with the issue of the lack of wisdom that the Corinthian believers had. They were not qualified for church leadership because they were still babes in Christ. Wisdom is a sign of spiritual maturity. The third thing we saw about biblical wisdom is biblical wisdom is not the same as worldly wisdom. In other words, not a matter of simply knowing how to succeed in this life. There are many people who are uh, clever about getting along in life, and so they make their way through. That's not biblical wisdom. Earthly wisdom is set in contrast to biblical wisdom all the way through the scripture. It talks about in 1 Corinthians 2.13, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. The wisdom that we're talking about here is the wisdom that is given by the Holy Spirit. A man who is filled with the Spirit is going to have wisdom from the Spirit, and that is set in contrast by the Apostle Paul to the man's wisdom. 1 Corinthians 3.19, for the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. We're not talking about worldly wisdom. Uh, chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians. For rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. And, you know, there are many, many passages that set in contrast those two forms of wisdom. 
James says it very well when he talks about the wisdom that is of the world, uh, and it is from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And then he contrasts it with the wisdom that is from God. We'll get there in a moment. The fourth thing about biblical wisdom is knowing and doing the will of God. A man who is a deacon, or who is appointed to the office of deacon, must know and be doing the will of God. He must be spiritually mature. He's not merely someone who has worldly wisdom, knows how to cut business deals at the bank to borrow money. That's not what we're talking about here. It's knowing and doing the will of God. Fifth thing, biblical wisdom involves teaching others divine truth that causes spiritual growth. A deacon must not be appointed unless he is able to teach others divine truth that causes spiritual growth. Colossians 1.28 Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The communication of wisdom is to bring about spiritual growth. The sixth thing, biblical wisdom, involves teaching divine truth through the use of music. Very interesting, that verse in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. As you sing through hymns, you should be listening to what the words say. You should be paying attention. We have a lot of hymns in all the hymn books that have some weird words in them. Uh, and they do. Uh, they have words that are not in harmony with the scripture. They have words that are contrary to the scripture. You know, make sure that your doctrine is correct because music makes things stick. Music makes things stick. And so Paul talks about it in the context of wisdom. Eighth, biblical wisdom involves a clean testimony to the watching world. These are men who are going to have a clean testimony to the watching world. Walk in wisdom for them that are without redeeming the time. That is to the unbelievers on the outside. When you walk in wisdom, you are carrying the right and appropriate testimony to the world. We find that Stephen was a man that was that way. As we move through the New Testament, especially as we get into the doctrinal epistles and the Apostle Paul begins to deal with the other uh, character qualities of deacons, it's going to be a testimony to the watching world, and he's going to mention that in relation to elders. He's going to mention that in relation to deacons. Then next, biblical wisdom is a matter of asking in faith based on the word of God. These are men who have got to be men of faith. And you notice that it said that Stephen was full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. He was a man of faith, walking by faith and not by sight. You've heard me preach many messages dealing with the walk of faith. You've heard me many times make allusions to Hebrews chapter 11, as we did in the sermon this morning, about what it means to walk by faith. When all the rest of the world around you looks wrong, and when it looks like it's not in harmony with what is supposed to be reality, you say, well, reality is what God says. Reality is the word world from God's viewpoint, not from man's viewpoint. So therefore, I will believe the promises of God, although they don't look like they're happening right now. I will believe the promises of God. I will walk forward by faith. I will take a step in the direction the word of God tells me to go. And that's what every one of the heroes of faith did in Hebrews chapter 11. Wisdom is a matter of asking in faith based on the word of God. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it, that is wisdom, shall be given to him. It assumes a knowledge of scripture. Wisdom is based on the word of God always, the context there of James. And if you do not have the word of God as your constant daily input, if you're not memorizing it, meditating upon it, uh, inculcating it and engrafting it into your soul, you will discover that you have very little wisdom. But as you have an intake of the word of God, it is the Holy Spirit giving understanding and illumination of the scriptures whereby you gain wisdom so that you see things from God's perspective and are able to move forward on the basis of faith. Biblical wisdom must be visible through a lifestyle of good works and meekness. A deacon, deacon should not be appointed to the office unless he has a lifestyle of good works and meekness, James 3.13, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you. Let him show visible manifestation. Let him show out of a good conversation, that is, manner of life, his works with meekness of wisdom. A man who is going to be appointed to the office of deacon must be visible. He must be on the radar screen. It's like someone once said, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? A deacon must have enough evidence to convict him of being a Christian. He must have a visible life that shows a meekness and a moral purity, the kind of lifestyle that is filled with divine knowledge and divine wisdom.
And finally, biblical wisdom will always be characterized by eight character qualities, beginning with moral purity. No man should be appointed to the office of deacon who is not morally pure. James 3.17 But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Now these men in Acts 6 were supposed to be filled with the Holy Ghost and also filled with wisdom. And the wisdom that's from above is first pure. Very first character quality listed by James. Then peaceable. These are not to be feisty men. These are not to be men who have a short fuse. These are not to be men who have a hot temper. These are not to be men who are always jumping to conclusions and blowing somebody up. Uh, they are to be pure. Then they're to be peaceful. Then they are to be gentle. They handle things in a meek and mild manner. They are easy to be entreated. They are full of mercy. They are full of good fruits. They are without partiality. That is, they don't uh, play favorites. And they are without hypocrisy. They are not double-faced. They are not two-tongued. They are not, like the Indian said, Man, white men speak with forked tongue. No. These are men who have these character qualities before they are ever appointed to the office of a deacon. And we saw they're also in submission to apostolic authority. That is, the apostles say whom we may appoint over this business. They recognize the authority of the apostles to do the appointing. And then they recognize that their ministry is an obligation uh, whom we appoint over this business. And we saw that the word business there is crea, which means employment, a full-time responsibility, certainly in the church, but we find here in Acts chapter 6. And so now we move into uh, part 2 of the book, uh, or of the responsibilities of deacons, and it brings us to the point where we have to introduce the doctrinal statement of Paul concerning the office of a deacon uh, over in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to pick up with the last verse dealing with elders in the preceding section, so I'm going to start reading here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7 and following. Moreover, and we're talking about elders at this point still, moreover he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Of course, that's taking us back to what we've already seen about deacons. They have to have an honest report of them that are without. We're going to see a little bit later on, as we get farther down this list dealing with the deacons, uh, that there's one qualification that actually puts them on a springboard to be moved into the office of an elder. These are men who already know how to proclaim the word of God. We see that with Stephen here. We see that with the other deacons. We see that with some of the other qualifications that are given for deacons. But there's a word that puts them on a springboard and gets them ready and prepared for the office of an elder. It says, likewise, must the deacons be grave. That little word, likewise, is a very important word. We'll talk about it in a moment. Must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine. Of course, the double tongue takes us back to the issue of hypocrisy. Not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also, and here is something that most churches never do, let them also first be proved. In other words, you've got to make sure before the man is ever appointed to the office of a deacon that first he has been put to the test and make sure that he passes all the qualifications. Now there are 17 qualifications listed in the New Testament for deacons. There are 21 qualifications that are listed for elders. Let these also first be proved. Put to the test. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. That doesn't mean sinless and we'll talk about it when we get there. But they're first tested, and then they get to use the office of deacon if, after they've been tested, they are found to be blameless. But, you know, it extends not merely to the deacons. It also extends to their wives. There are some tests that the wives of a deacon must go through. And if the wives don't pass these tests, the man shouldn't be put in the office. I've seen so many situations where you had a godly man. You had a man who really would be qualified, but he has a wife who disqualifies him from the office of a deacon. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. And then we move back to the deacon, but it's in relation to the wife and the children. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. Some very important test qualifications there before the man is put into the office. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. We see that certainly was the case with Stephen. He had great boldness in the faith. He had an articulate testimony whereby he could refute the gainsayers. 
He had an articulate testimony whereby he could put down those people who were contrary to the faith. And then the Apostle Paul goes on, he says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. In other words, if I don't get there soon enough to give you personalized instruction, you need to make sure that the deacons in the church meet these qualifications. It will help you avoid a lot of problems as you get down the road. He says, I hope I can come there soon, but if I don't, if I tarry long, this is so you can know how you ought to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And then he gives a, a, a beautiful paean of praise, but it's in the context of deacons. Here is what they must be able to articulate. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Each one of those is a huge area of theology. Your deacons are not really someone who says, well, yeah, I know how to get saved, and, you know, if somebody really pushes me, I guess, I guess I'd tell them, but, you know, I, I hope nobody ever pushes me. <laughs> These are men who are articulate in very major areas of theology. They are people who are able to articulate their faith, as did Stephen, and defend it. Now we move back here to verse 8, and uh, verse 7 and 8. The term, in, likewise, in verse 8, takes us back to the moral qualifications of the elders that we see in verses 1 through 7. But verse 7 speaks of the impeccable testimony that an elder must have before a watching world. So the deacon must have an impeccable testimony before the watching world. How important that is. You know, you are going to come under scrutiny. And the higher in office that you get in a local church, the more scrutiny you are going to come under. Because the world around you is always looking for a place for you to fall. A place for you to slip up. My dad was a pastor, a wise and godly man. And I remember him telling me, Christian, you know, it may not seem fair to you, but the preacher's kids have got to be the best kids in the church. Because everybody looks at the preacher's kids. You folks here look at my kids. And with some of them, you look at them with pleasure. And with some of them, I think you might look at them with some displeasure. The preacher's kids, the elder's kids, the bishop's kids, the deacon's kids, the Sunday school teacher's kids, are always going to be put, not on a platform that's higher for everybody to emulate, but on a platform so that they are better targets to shoot at. It always happens that way. And so that's why we have some qualifications here that deal with wives and with kids. Some very, very tough qualifications. We're going to talk about that as we get down to it. But we find that the elder is standing in front of a watching world, and likewise, the deacon is standing in front of a watching world. It says in verse 7, it speaks of the reproach of the devil and the snare of the devil. We're going to be talking about those two words. What is the difference between the reproach of the devil and the snare of the devil? The snare, the pagis of the devil. There is one very specific thing that we are told is the snare of the devil uh, in the New Testament, but we'll come to that later. Something else we see now as we move into verse 8. Verse 8 envisions a plurality of deacons. It says, likewise must the deacons be grave. We see that there are a plurality of deacons, not merely in the church of Jerusalem, which had this gigantic group of people to whom they were ministering, but we find even a small church like the church at Philippi. Philippians 1.1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. There's a plurality, both of bishops and deacons, at Philippi. It was not a gigantic church. It was one of the smaller New Testament churches. And we find a plurality there. It's rather interesting because as you look at the models set by our Lord Jesus Christ, when he sends out his disciples to minister, he sends them by twos. Uh, that's uh, important for a number of reasons. That's important for encouragement. Uh, you know, when you're all by yourself, it's very easy to be, get discouraged. You think of Elijah in the Old Testament. You think how he stands up against the prophets of Baal. There are 400 prophets of Baal. Elijah's all by himself. He's able to go out with great energy. And after that, he runs ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way down to uh, the city. And then Jezebel says to him, I'm going to have your head before this time tomorrow. And Elijah turns and runs south. 
and he runs all the way down to Beersheba. I mean, that guy was in good shape. <laughs> he got all the way down there and he sat under a juniper tree and he said, you know, I'm not better than my father. He's not want to die. You know, total utter discouragement. He was all by himself. He had no one there who was going to encourage him. There was no one there who was going to pat him on the shoulder and God let him rest and he wakes up and there's an angel there who's gotten some food for him and some water and he rests and gets up again and eats and then he goes on his journey all the way down to Horeb where he meets God. God tells him, I want you to go back. I got you a job to do. You're going to appoint somebody else. But I just wanted to let you know I've got 7,000 men in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal. But Elijah felt like he was all alone. It is a very lonely position when there's just one and not two. By the way, I think that's one of the reasons also why we have requirements concerning deacons and wives and pastors and wives. There's an encouragement there. There's a blessing there. But when our Lord Jesus Christ sent out the 70, do you remember? He sent them two by two. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. And after these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather because your names are written in heaven. Our Lord Jesus Christ gives us the encouragement of multiplicity in ministry. And I think that's one very important reason that we see a plurality of deacons. There's also the wisdom in that because they're going to be dealing with the widows in the church, as we see in Acts chapter 7 and in other churches as well. Now, the term deacon, as we mentioned before, means servant. It's used in a number of different ways in the New Testament, that particular term. It's used, for example, of literal servants at a wedding feast. We know of the wedding at Cana of Galilee in John chapter 2. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, that's said unto the deacons. <laughs> Didn't know there were deacons at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, did you? Well, that's the word that's used here. And there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. They filled them up to the brim, and he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants, the deacons, which knew, drew the water, knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. The term is used of literal servants, clearly, in that passage there. But we find that our Lord Jesus Christ in his parables sometimes uses that term to speak of angelic servants. Uh, as we look at the parables of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of heaven where the king is making a marriage for his son, there are servants who are gathering in certain individuals and when they don't come they go out and gather other individuals and then somebody comes in who does not have a wedding garment and the king says to him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Matthew 22:13 says, then said the king to his servants, and of course we're talking about the wedding of the lamb here. It says, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the job of the angels as we read the book of Revelation, as we read the book of Daniel and several other Old Testament prophecies. For many are called and few are chosen. We find the term is used as the basis for the spiritual office being found in Christ. He is the one who is the servant of all. He is the one who washes the disciples' feet. And he tells the disciples, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Matthew 23, verses 10 through 12 very important to understand that our Lord Jesus Christ himself sets the pattern for those who would be deacons. Jesus himself sets the pattern of the servant. This is a very important and highly responsible office that must reflect Christ. And when a man does not reflect Christ in a spirit of servanthood, he is not qualified to be a deacon in a local church.
We find that the spiritual gift of ministration is essential to the office of deacon. Now we're going to talk about the gift of ministration because it is distinct from the office of deacon. It is a spiritual gift that is given to many others besides deacons, but it is a spiritual gift that is necessary before a man can offer the service of a deacon. We find that the word diakonos and the verbal form diakonia uh, is the word that is translated minister in many different passages. And so it's used of other things as well as church deacons. It's, for example, used of governmental authority as being from God in Romans chapter 13, verse 4. We find that that term is used of the Apostle Paul, who had a continuously exercising the gift of ministration throughout his ministry, even though he was an apostle. He had that particular gift. And he functioned in different situations, as you know, both as an elder and also sometimes as a deacon in churches. Uh, we find him functioning that way prior to him going on a number of his missionary journeys. We find that he is a man who is spiritually mature. He's a man who could be appointed and later who does appoint others. We find that the term is used to Paul specifically in the second important function of the gift of ministration, which is the ministration of the word. That term is used for proclamation of the scripture, the ministration or the humble service of, the deaconing of the word of God. Multiple passages on that, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, Ephesians 3, 6 and 7, Colossians 1, 23 and 25, and so on. We find this term is used of men, of course, who function as deacons in the local churches. And a number of them are listed for us. And we see not only those who are listed here, but we also find it used of Timothy. Uh, we find it used of men who had additional gifts, such as the gift of prophet or the gift of evangelist. We see Philip, it's used of him, and he has the gift of evangelist, as we find out later on. Uh, we see that it is used uh, of individuals in the church at Ephesus. Uh, it's a, a tremendous position as well as a tremendous obligation of service. It should never be scorned and it should never be abused. The term to use the office of a deacon, the akaneo, we find it used in 1 Timothy 3, of course, as we've just read, speaking of men who have been appointed deacons. We find it is translated in Acts as the word serve. We find it is translated in Acts 19 of Timothy and Erastus who are exercising the gift of ministration to Paul. We find it used in 2 Corinthians 3.3 3 of the Apostle Paul in terms of his exercise of the gift of ministration to the church at Corinth. We find it in 2 Corinthians 8.19 and 20 in relation to the gift of giving of those who serve by carrying the gift from one church to another church. As a church in Greece, takes a, or in Macedonia, it takes a gift uh, back to the needy believers who are at Jerusalem. We find the term is used of 2 Corinthians 1.18 of Onesiphorus, uh, perhaps one of the deacons at Ephesus, who diligently sought out the opportunity to exercise the gift of ministration and mercy to the Apostle Paul. We find the term used in Philemon 13 of Onesimus the slave and his exercise of the spiritual gift of ministration to Paul. We find Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, it's used of the Hebrew Christians who were probably at Jerusalem, I'm convinced they were, who had been outstanding in ministering to the needs of needy believers who were under persecution. We find it used in 1 Peter 1.12 of the service rendered by Old Testament prophets in the writing of the Old Testament for us to whom understanding has now been given. We find it in 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 10 and 11 where it is used of service re rendered in the exercise of the gift of hospitality as a stewardship from God. So this is a, a tremendous word. It covers a lot of territory. It shows the types of things that men will do who are involved in this office. Not merely the ministering to the widows, as we talked about last week, but there are many other aspects of the service that is rendered by men who are in the office of deacon as they minister to, as they serve, a humble service, the body of Christ. We see the term being used, uh, diakonia, in the gift of ministration. Uh, the only historical usage in the Gospels is Luke chapter 10, verse 40. Uh, but we find it stated, the gift of ministration stated as a gift, a spiritual gift in Romans chapter 12. Uh, you know, the big key passages for the spiritual gift are Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, and we find it also in Ephesians chapter 4, another list of spiritual gifts. Other spiritual gifts are scattered in smaller passages, but those are your large main passages passages that deal with the spiritual gifts in the New Testament, and we find that in Romans chapter 12 and in Ephesians chapter 4, it is stated as a spiritual gift. 
We find it is used of the office from which Judas fell by transgression in Acts chapter 1, verses 17 and 25. We find it is used of the functioning of the gift in a practical outworking of the appointment of the first deacons in Acts chapter 6. We find it used in relation to the gift of giving in Acts chapter 11 and verse 29, as Barnabas and Paul, uh, who are functioning as deacons at the church at Antioch, carry that gift. We find it is used of the spoken ministry of the word in multiple places in the New Testament. There are about ten different locations of where that, and find it often translated office. We find it used of managing the monies of the churches in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. We find it used of the proper exercise of all the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 5. We find it used of the proclamation of the word of rec reconciliation, which is the responsibility of every believer in 2 Corinthians chapter 5.8. We find it used the physical ministrations by Paul to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3, and of Mark to Paul. We find it used of men who were evangelists over certain churches, but also seen as functioning in the office of deacon as well as the elders, Colossians 4.17, Philemon 2, and so on. It's used of service rendered to the saints by the angelic forces around us. That's interesting. They are also spoken of serving us, and this same word is used in Hebrews 1.14. Uh, and in verse 7, we find um, from this, I've, I've swept you through a major study because I want to talk about these specific qualifications as we get down here a little further uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, but these are the ways in which the word is used. So it gives you an idea of the scope of this word, the kind of things that these men would be doing in multiple different kinds of contexts. We discover that the office entails humble service to other believers through the exercise of ministration. I'm summarizing here. It's used in distributing the funds of the assembly to needy believers within the assembly and to other needy assemblies from one church to another church. The exercise of the gift of hospitality relates to this responsibility in 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, we'll discover that both elders and deacons must have a, an outreach in terms of hospitality in their homes. Too many people want to keep their home as their castle and no one but themselves and their family ever get through the door of that place. But that's not the picture that we get in the New Testament. These are men who open their homes to others and they use their homes as a base for ministration. And a man is best seen in the context of his home. That is where you see in microcosm what you will get in macrocosm in the church. Very important to learn that when we get to the gift of hospitality, the Lord willing, someday. We will be talking about that in detail. We find that these deacons will be following the example of Christ in their method of service and in their type of service. We'll discover that only spiritually mature men, as we have stated already, will ever or should ever be appointed to the office of deacon. I'm going to stop it at that point. Uh, there is so much to do here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that we'll have to pick it up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you for these uh, tremendous portions of scripture that we've looked at tonight, trying to tie a, a big overview together so that we can see as we look at the details exactly what kind of men should be appointed to the office of deacon. Your word is great. It is gracious. It is true. Your word gives to us your standards, not man's standards. Your word also tells us that you will give us the necessary grace and empowerment to do those things that you've called us to do. And so, Father, we pray for the going forth of your word tonight, again, that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. We thank you once again, Father, for the word of God and for its power, and pray your blessings on what we have heard tonight as you let it sink into our hearts. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.